I once had a professor who told me that you can look at life from either a telescopic or a microscopic point of view. And they can both be very important and very wonderful because when you're looking at the small parts, you see the details. And when you're looking at the big picture, well, you see the big picture. And every now and then we meet someone who does both. And my guest today is in that category. Craig Carpenter Downer is a wildlife ecologist who looks at the big picture of animal rights and the environment from being a vegan and practicing this day to day. And he also looks very pointedly at three amazing species. And we're going to be talking about all this today. Hi, everybody. I'm Victoria Moran, host of the Main Street Vegan Program. Thank you so much for being with us today. Whether you're listening on Unity Online Radio or your favorite podcast platform, or more recently, maybe you're watching on YouTube on my channel, Victoria Moran NYC. Wonderful to have you on any of these uh, platforms. So happy that you have chosen to spend this hour with us. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about my fascinating guest who is with us luxuriously for the entire hour. Craig Downer is a wildlife ecologist who has fought for the wild horses and burrows and their natural free lifestyle and viable habitats all his adult life. He has also done groundbreaking studies on the endangered Andean mountain taper and has been instrumental in protecting major habitats for this beleaguered species through his work for the IUCN SSC Taper Specialist Group Wildlife Conservation Society, Durham University in the UK, and Ecuadorian, Colombian, and Peruvian governments. And he is, as I said, a vegan in order to eliminate the terrible and needless suffering and death of many sentient beings and restore the world to a natural, harmonious, and balanced relationship. Welcome, Craig. Well, thank you. It's a real honor to be on your program, Victoria. Well, it's wonderful to be talking with you. You come highly recommended. I was getting all of these emails from people saying, you have to have this man on. And <laughs> uh, when I get that many, I trust that that's true. <laughs> and I, so I'll, I'll here we are. That, uh, so so tell us a little bit of, about yourself just as a human you have been doing this for a long time it's almost like you came to earth knowing that this was your mission yeah i really that's really true uh, i'm uh, um, sending the pioneers here go back several generations in nevada in the west and parts of california and i always felt a calling to um, nature to a reverence for life attitude and i grew up I was blessed with wonderful parents and brother and sister, and and I grew up here uh, in in the country setting uh, near wilderness areas. And on my um, horse Poco, who was a wonderful stallion that was a Morgan Arabian and had been used earlier as a mustanger horse. That means a horse who chases down and lassoes mustangs. But of course, I didn't use him for that capacity. I used him to go and um, see all these wonderful mountains and, and desert valleys and uh, natural areas and just ride around in the, in the Sierras and in the desert and, um, and view the, the wild horses themselves. So uh, it was, uh, I had a real special upbringing here and had a wonderful mother who was a school teacher and uh, pianist too, a real accomplished pianist. Uh, and my father was a, a civil engineer and very intelligent man. He knew knew various languages, very good in Spanish, and he also knew French and German. But uh, basically, they were uh, progressive uh, progressive people that wanted to make life better, and they had had a um, a real uh, ability to defend uh, the underdogs and, and not, not just you know um, segments of the human society but also uh, 
animal sin. They, they had a real conscience. So I was blessed to have them uh, as my parents. And, and, um, and so they, I, they believed greatly in education. So they made sure I, all their children had wonderful educational opportunities. So I was able to go on to Berkeley to get my basic degree and then and then my advanced degree at University of Nevada, Reno here, and then later the, the PhD program. I was first at Kansas University and then later I ended up at Durham University in England. Oh, that's so wonderful. And you also just inspire me as a parent, the things that we can give to our children just by who we are. It, it's, it's so beautiful. So I'd like you to talk a little bit first, uh, Dr. Downer, you actually didn't put your PhD in your intro sheet. So that's humility. Uh, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, talk yeah. to me about living in the American West, because I think those of us from other parts of, of North America we just don't know what you guys have out there in terms of terrain, in terms of life, wildlife and big wildlife. I mean, just all kinds yeah. of species that we don't think about as, as being a native to this, this land. Well, well, right. Uh, the American West is just fantastic. It still has some great, wide open spaces, as they say. And I live here in the Great Basin, which is the area between the Rockies and the Sierra Nevada mountains. So I, I live pretty much on the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas. But the Great Basin has more mountain ranges and valleys than just about any other place on earth. It uh, has like 340 major mountain ranges. And I uh, most of them are north-south uh, orientation, but where I live uh, is an old Indian stomping ground uh, called the Indian Hills, and it, it is an ancient mountain range that runs east and west and used to tower uh, higher than the Sierra Nevada. But yeah, it has an incredible diversity from desert to uh, uh, rain, rainforest to, you know, the redwood, giant redwoods just to the south here where I live, and the coastal redwoods. It has uh, the chaparral over in California. Uh, it just has incredible variety, and much of this is still public land, uh, and much has been declared wilderness, or it's been declared legal habitats for the wild horse and burrows. Uh, the Wild Horse and Burrow Act, I've been so involved with, uh, and endangered species sanctuaries, uh, special areas of critical ecological concern where there's little uh, endemic uh, endangered pup fish, for example, out here in the desert, little, little desert springs. It's just a fascinating area, and there's some of the hottest areas here and some of the wettest and coldest as well like way up in, in Montana where you get blizzards. Um, so it's just a, a really fascinating area. And, and I think all Americans should um, appreciate their great country and their great heritage and really stand up for all these laws um, that protect uh, nature. Because I, I really see that as crucial to preserving life on earth if we're going to preserve life on earth today yes we we need to uh preserve what's left and restore because each one of these i call them islands of hope these little natural areas that remain and sometimes they're quite big you know um but they're like the templates for restoring uh, our earth and for restoring balance to the atmosphere, for example, with uh, the global warming, or I call it global heating, because it's a very serious situation. Uh, the natural ecosystem uh, can bring balance back if we people allow, allow the natural ecosystems to restore balance. And I'm a great believer, and I have a great knowledge uh, about how 
the naturally living horse and burros are tremendous healers. They're, they're superior carbon sequesters. I just did a study this summer about carbon sequestration. I had a little support from Love Wild Horses and um, I wrote up a scientific uh, article on that. And um, uh, we just have to register this. They also can reduce a lot of dry flammable vegetation that uh, is so uh, essential for these, uh, these fires to get started that, that are devastating a lot of our, the remaining natural habitat here, especially the forest. And that's, that's a great concern because, well, that's the last of these natural homes, you know, and I think every, every, everyone, every, everyone anywhere has to stand up, not to say there isn't a lot that remains in the east, in your part of the country, there's really precious areas there like, to preserve. Yes. Well, I took a trip, as I told you uh, before we started the show, uh, I, in my youth, so we're talking about 40 years ago, over 40 years ago, and we drove up from Kansas City, Missouri, where I lived at the time, it's my hometown, and we went through South Dakota, North Dakota, and Montana, Wyoming, um, Idaho, and Washington, Oregon, California. And the things that I saw, I think particularly in the Dakotas, Montana, and Wyoming, are etched in my psyche. Right. And what I want to ask you is how different would it be if I took this trip today? So I saw wild horses. I saw these, these wild burrows who were just the most adorable creatures yeah. that you could imagine. And then I saw prairie dog towns that seemed like they went on forever. How much of that has been lost? Uh, a lot of it has been uh, greatly altered or destroyed of those habitats and those populations, unfortunately, simply because the uh, development, there's uh, a, have been a lot of mining activity and a lot of uh, fracking and general expansion of, of human occupation, uh, towns, cities, roads, mines, uh, water tables drained to provide water for subdivisions or towns or factories, mines. So uh, a lot of that has been seriously uh, eliminated, but um, there's still a lot that remains. So it's not too late. Let's not give up. And right. <laughs> well, let's talk. We do. But yeah, there's still some really awesome places here. And the, the wonderful thing about nature is it is resilient. You know, as Darwin said, there's a struggle to survive. So every there's a struggle to survive among the spe uh, species or the individuals or their populations. And so it, it can recover. And, the, you know, nature is amazing. The, the life community is amazing from the, the microscopic to the the megascopic level, it's, it's just, uh, you know, it's a wonder and uh, we should respect it and learn to live uh, with reverence for life, really, like the Hindus say, you know, or the Buddhists uh, live, live. And with, Albert with, Schweitzer. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. So. <laughs> Albert <laughs> and, Schweitzer, one of my, my uh, idol. Yeah. Well, reverence for life is a beautiful phrase, but you said another beautiful phrase that I don't think I've ever heard before. You referred to the life community. Yes, right. Life community, right. It's wow. we're all if one we could, community. Yeah. Yes. In, if we could uh, get it, that we're part of that. Well, I come right. from uh, the area here where I live is where the uh, famous Northern Paiute prophet Waboka uh, lived and where he had his mystic visions. And I feel in attuned to that. Um, I just ever since I was a child, I people would even say, are you part Indian or something? No, uh, because I had, I had such um, a feeling about respect for life. And I felt that all the animals shouldn't be caged or cooped up or fenced in. I felt 
hey, every animal should have a free natural life because otherwise it's just a prisoner, you know, a slave. And that was innate. And I, we were called in high school here at Douglas County High School uh, in our scene, uh, later um, years in the um, four year high school is to uh, do a speech, each one of us to do a speech and to say, uh, to highlight something we felt was a problem or that needed to be changed in Douglas County and Carson Valley and this area here with the, the mountains and the valleys. And uh, it's a beautiful area, you know, even includes parts of Lake Powell and the Pine Nut Mountains where the wild horses roam. And immediately I, uh, I said, well, the fences, I think fences that fence in here there's a lot of ranches too there's mainly cattle and some sheep ranches and a lot of these have grazing uh, privileges which by the way are are not right they're privileges to graze that can be canceled so i just said well i think there's too much fencing in of life you no know, you see these thousands of cattle being fenced and and sheep, and, and then they let them out to strip the vegetation on the public land, and then and they gather them in. And, you know, they it's, it's done as a subsidy, a subsidized industry on our public land. And I just said, hey, you know, shouldn't we allow a natural balance? Even then in high school, this was within me, you know, this concept that you know, we should have a much more natural way of life. And that really stirred up a lot of, um, you know, raised a lot of eyebrows and <laughs> people scratched their heads and they <laughs> said, you know, uh, I think Craig might be a reincarnated Indian, <laughs> Native American. And I said, well, yeah, I'd be proud to be a, a reincarnated Native American. But I, I do, bet. have I have a lot of sympathy for their, now I don't, believe I have any genetic uh, lineage, uh, but, but maybe I am, uh, maybe I had past lives as a, as a well, You certainly uh, seem like uh, you've been doing a lot of good stuff for a long time, <laughs> past <laughs> yeah. lives or, or even just this one. Yeah, so yeah. I, I had I, that innate feeling for the animals and yes. uh, especially I had a lot of empathy for those who were captivated. Yes. who had to just, just sit or stand or whatever, live out their lives in tiny little exclosures, you know. Mm, terrible. That, that really got to me. And that's why I became, you know, started being a vegetarian and then on into veganism. Cool. That lived, yeah, age well, 18. Ah, well, yeah. let me, I, I keep wanting to get back to the sequestering question, but since you brought up the vegetarianism and veganism, Give us that story first, then we'll get on to sequestering carbon. So yeah. how did you become a vegetarian yeah. and then a vegan? I just had this tremendous empathy whenever I'd get around animals that were, they were like calling out to me. They say, hey, what are you going to get me out of here? I mean, chickens or horses in tiny little uh, corrals or, or even cattle, you know, or, or sheep. They would seem to like, communicate to me, help me. Um, I, I want to live. I want to have a life. I don't want to be treated just like an object or taken for, for granted that I'm important too. So that's when I stopped eating domesticated animal products. And um, I would still occasionally eat some, uh, some fish that I felt was, was okay. But with, with all the onslaught and all the terrible things that go on with fishing and also big game hunting, how the, the, the hunting industry takes over the public lands and kills the predators. And, and since the wild horse, for example, isn't a hunted animal, they, they um, go against them too, because they want it all for their deer and elk, you know, and, and uh, bighorn sheep to make a lot of money. And, that just seems so hypocritical, you know. So I, I wrote some, I joined Earth First and I went on some campaigns. I wrote some articles about how the non-game animals were not being treated fairly here in Nevada by the Department of Wildlife. 
and that was published uh, in the papers and also in the Earth First Journal uh, about how non-game animals, even endangered species, were, were being neglected by most of the state wildlife departments. So that got a lot of people um, kind of uh, on arms, and I think it had a lot of uh, beneficial effects too, where these agencies and these peoples that were being uh, people that were being cha uh, challenged were they were uh, uh, offended at first and you know okay you say who's this upstart you know criticizing us and he, who does he know and all that you know but then they they thought and they said well he's actually right you know we need to consider the whole balance and one of the main points I made as a wild horse and burrow defender is that hey, they're, they're deeply rooted native species in North America. They're one of the most deeply rooted groups of mammals. And they go back you know, almost to the time of the dinosaurs, almost 60 million years ago. And how can you deny that? Because that's one of the best fossil records uh, in, in existence in, the, in paleontology, the study of uh, the history of life on Earth. And I also genetically, that's been proven by, by Dr. Anna For, uh, Forsten of the Finnish, famous Finnish geneticist and, and um, corroborated by uh, Car Carlos Ville, uh, also there in Scandinavia. Uh, and I visited him, but I also, I would stress ecologically, I say, hey, it's that the law says these animals contribute to the uh, to the diversity of, or the, they enrich the diversity of life forms in our nation. And I said, okay, that really is so true because the ones you're promoting are all mainly um, a ruminant, with cloven hoofed, ruminant, uh, ruminant digesting uh, animals that belong to the bovid uh, family or the, the servant family. They're uh, like deer, big game, uh, you know, mule deer, elk, uh, domestic sheep or bighorn sheep or game. Uh, and, um, you know, the, these uh, animals, they have multi-stomachs and cloven hoofs, where it's the, the horse in burrow, it's in a whole different order. It's in the parasodactyl order, same as where the, the tapers and the, and the rhinos also belong. And they're a very ancient order and they have a different lifestyle and a different way of digesting and it, um, their uh, plants in a, in a different niche. And yet it's a niche that is not, it couldn't be seen as in competition or in opposition to these other animals. The, the cloven hoofs ruminant, uh, but complementary to them. And there's been some really wonderful studies, uh, and I've noticed that in my studies of both the, the wild horses and the mountain tapers, that they actually complement so many other species and, and they enrich the life community. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with the fact, and this is what I wrote in this um, uh, in this carbon sequestration study that I did this past summer, is that the digestive system does not as thoroughly degrade the, the plants that they eat. And consequently, their droppings uh, have, still have a lot of uh, intact organic molecules that feed the ecosystem, they, they contribute greatly to the humus content. The humus is, and as any gardener will tell you, humus is a vital uh, component of soils for rich soils. It helps uh, facilitate the, the transfer of nutrients. It's, uh, it's nutrient rich, and it also helps absorb and retain water, moisture, so it helps increase water tables or aquifers. And that's really big for global warming uh, combating. You know, let's restore the aquifers, especially in these drier areas. Whereas 
the ruminant digestive system, the multi doing uh, ruminant fermentation of the of these cows and sheep and deer and elk, uh, moose and all those others, um, is very uh, droppings are very poor in nutrients and very dry and without nutrients. So they don't contribute nearly as much to rich enrichment of soils as do the uh, horse and the burrow droppings. And same can be said about the paper and the rhino. And there's been really good studies throughout the world that prove that. And it became very obvious that to ignore this point is really to be intentionally blind. And that offended me because I've been a scholar, you know, practically all my life. And uh, I do care for the wild. I have a special relationship with or with the horses and the burrows, and they mean a lot. And I believe a lot in their in their right to live free and to fulfill their role. But to see basic uh, bio uh, biology ignored, especially when it's positive, and it's just um, very aggravating to me. Very aggravating. Well, this is so fascinating. And I think all we've heard about carbon sequestration are these people that say we need to have cattle ev everywhere, which is so discouraging to us who don't want people raising cattle. So I am thrilled to pieces that we have a second half. And after these wonderful messages from the good people at Unity Online Radio, we will be back with more with Dr. Craig Downer. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. Isn't this fascinating? I just feel that this whole idea of a life community is such a tremendous thing. So for those of you who have not long been part of the Main Street Vegan community, please check out everything that we do at MainStreetVegan.net. We have our show notes there where we'll have all the ways that you can find out the wonderful work of our guests today. Craig Downer, PhD. You can find his website, thewildhorseconspiracy.org. And he has a book, The Wild Horse Conspiracy, which we will also link to in the show notes. He's got a couple of Facebook pages, The Wild Horse Conspiracy and The Andean Taper Fund. So, Welcome back, Dr. Downer. So you. you hadn't quite finished on carbon sequestration. So help us understand more well, about that. Okay. Well, carbon in the atmosphere, especially carbon dioxide, but also other carbon gases like methane uh, are causing um, the trapping of heat in, uh, in the air, which is accelerating the, uh, the greenhouse effect or the oven effect on earth, which is extremely alarming. It's, uh, we don't want to cook on this planet. And we could uh, look at Venus. Venus is thousands of degrees Fahrenheit and uh, life as we know it would be totally impossible there. So we certainly don't want to do that to our planet. That would be a terrible legacy. So there are many plants and animals that can help take carbon out the air and sequester it, which means to lock it away, like hoard it away. And the reason I, I say the, the horses and the burrows and the tapers and rhinos are so superior at carbon sequestration or locking away carbon is because their digestive system doesn't as thoroughly decompose the plant matter that they consume as herbivores. They're good vegans you know but and but they share you know it through their droppings they don't extract all so much of the rumen uh, of the nutrients as the ruminants do the cloven hoof uh cows and sheep and everything so this is a great benefit so i actually tell ranchers i say hey you know their studies have proven that equid or members of the horse family actually help cattle and sheep they thrive more more perfectly uh, when there are like zebras around or, or horses. And you should recognize that fact. And also the fact that they, horses, wild horses roam around more and they get up to steeper rocker 
rockier areas, and they can help prevent uh, or reduce the fuel load or the, the dry tinder that enables these catastrophic wildfires, which are such a terrible threat to us today. Another point I wanted to make is the fact that they don't as thoroughly compose what they ingest. This includes many seeds of many different plant species, many of which are native and that the horses actually co-evolved with for thousands, even millions of years. So it's been observed by objective scientists that they actually reseed uh, and they, they leave a fertile bed with their manure, uh, their droppings, which enables many of these seeds to disperse and then to germinate. And at the same time, have, new, uh, have a lot of mo more moisture because uh, the, the, the droppings that mix in with the, the, uh, the basic current materials in the soil create a, uh, um, a moist and nutrient-rich uh, germinative bed for many seeds. And I, I actually have done experiments, uh, germination experiments uh, in coordination with um, scientists who are specialized in that. Uh, I did that for the endangered mountain taper and wrote it up in my uh, scientific publications. Uh, and it's, it's absolutely, it's, it's basic science, it's proven. And, and same thing with the uh, horse, the horse and, and burrow. That they, mm. uh, uh, as compared with uh, a cow dropping or deer dropping, they're way superior. That's why I say, hey, they're, they're uh, increasing the diversity of life forms like the Wild Horse of Burrow Act says in our nation. And they're, in, they're enhancing the life community. Mm -hmm. and, and the Wild Horse and Burrow Act and Wild Horse Annie and all those fine people who, who got that passed in 71, they were right on. They were right on. And the Wild Roaming Horse and Burrows Act has been cost, called one of the most truly ecological uh, laws that was ever passed uh, in our nation. It was passed unanimously, by the way. Mm -hmm. And it's a general public interest it's, and it's a, it's a quality of life uh, interest. So, so, so important you know, that we get it back on track. And currently there's a terrible uh, unbalance in our approach to public lands management. And we have to correct that, but that's not gonna happen just by, you know, wishing it. We have to get in people's face and write articles and even have protests that call your senators and representatives, call the president, your governors, uh, give, give speeches, uh, come involved, give input to the government on the, the different wild horse and burrow plans, uh, protest and be uh, uh, take advantage of the court. And I am now again, a legal plaintiff uh, to stop this terrible um, plan, uh, BLM and the Forest Service uh, are trying to perpetrate, which is to eliminate actually all the wild horse and burrows and then have the, the few that remain as drugged up, semi-domesticated um, animals that are no longer truly wild. So, I mean, that really... Uh, you know, sends me through the roof. It's just wrong. Um, I can imagine. Yeah. So BLM, that's the Bureau of Land Management. I think we Easterners yeah. <laughs> might not yeah. all know that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what, what did that Wild Horse and Burrow Act do in 1971? Just, just quickly so that we understand that. And what are we looking at now? I mean, what were the historic numbers? What are the current numbers? Give, give yes. us a sense of the problem okay. and the solution. At, at the time of the passage of that act, uh, there, uh, the government typically says there were only 17,000 wild horse and burrows left. But actually, there was probably two to th at least uh, two, probably more like three times that number, maybe 50,000 or, or thereabouts, because they didn't really start censusing them until the mid-70s. 
But one thing is certain, they were disappearing, they were being targeted and they were being eliminated uh, through very cruel means. And often they were being round up and, and just sent to uh, slaughter plants for, uh, for pet food. Uh, for, uh, and um, Wild Horse Annie observed the terrible cruelty here in Western Nevada and she trailed a, a truck dam full of uh, all, all the members of the family, the little colts and falls and mares. And, and she heard their whinnies and their cries for help and the blood, she saw the blood dripping. And then she just said, oh, this is just abominable. You know, I have to fight, I have to do everything I can to stop this. So she was very, uh, a very heroic lady who had great compassion and uh, the first law she got passed was in 1959, which prohibited the use of mechanized vehicles, particularly airplanes. She used a lot of airplanes and also big trucks, round them up and then haul them off mainly to the, to the slaughter plants. Uh, there was a lot of that that went on here in Nevada and elsewhere in the West. But then um, that wasn't as um, broad enough. so. The campaign kept going until we got full uh, federal protection on all the Bureau of Land Management and U.S. Forest Service lands where the wild horses remained in 1971. And that should be um, interpreted as their year-round habitats. So uh, they didn't really get around to identifying those areas until the mid, uh, mid or even late 1970s, but there was a lot of shenanigans that went on. Nonetheless, there were about uh, 53 and a half million acres that were identified as being legally theirs on BLM land. And then uh, I think around uh, 12 million or so, I'm not exactly sure, on the Forest Service land. Um, and then they said about to uh, uh, assign uh, what they call appropriate management levels, population levels for each area, and uh, forage allocation, that's called uh, typically animal unit months. And this is where a lot of unfairness in, because the big uh, exploitive interests, particularly the ranchers, uh, came in very aggressively to um, take away the rightful forage allocation and viable population levels that the wild horses and burros should have enjoyed on their own legal lands because section 2C of the Wild Free Roaming Horse and Burros Act says that this land shall be devoted principally to the welfare and benefit of wild horses and burros, not to, um, you know, aggressive and, and often selfish or tunnel vision ranchers or, or miners who want to go in and have big open pit mines or, you know, in, which end up poisoning the waters or, or uh, creating giant pits and really doing terrible destruction. Not, no, not them or to frackers, energy frackers who go in and drill and, and they end up uh, contaminating water sources, especially out here in the arid west where there's so little fresh water. So, uh, you know, I see the, the horses and burrows were a great safeguard against the, the, the demolishment of these natural ecosystems. And they were actually a wonderful restoration of these ecosystems. And that's proven by how readily these horses and burrows are able to readapt, well, this is, that's because they evolved here for millions of years. And they have what they call mutualistic symbiotic relationships with hundreds or even thousands of plants and animals that recognize them. That's why I say in my book, the grass remembers them. And that's something the Native Americans recognize too, because they were much more attuned when they weren't you know, taken over by our modern society, they were very attuned. And like the, the wise men would say, the grass remembers the horses. And that's so true. They, they were really tuned in. So it's a beautiful law. The Wild Free Roaming uh, Horses and Burrows Act 
was unanimously passed. And it's a beautiful law. And these animals come alive in so many ways when they're wild and free. And, and I believe they're like saviors, that they have a wonderful healing role on the earth. And they're like my family. I consider the wild horse, any horse or burrow, but to me, every horse and burrow is uh, wild at heart. You know, they're, that's their pure nature rather than just being slaves or servants of man. They really belong there. And so it's up to us people to learn how to share the world and, um, and freedom with them. Mm -hmm. so let's share the land and freedom with the wonderful uh, horses and burrows. That, so was, tell that us, was the noble intent of the act. Yes. Well, tell us a little bit about them. Just introduce us as if we've, I don't know, always been in New York City or on Mars. But tell us about a wild burrow. What's, what's that? What, yeah. What's the family like? What, what do they eat? What do they do? Now, the wild burrow, in contrast to the horse, is a territorial they uh, a territorial animal. Uh, the jack, the male, establishes a, a little uh, home range that he defends. So that makes it what uh, biologists call a territory. And then uh, females, or jennies, are attracted in, and he guards that little territory. So they actually space themselves out. Now, the, the uh, horses, the naturally living horses, are more semi-nomadic. They do have home ranges, and they can, can, to a limited extent, defend these, but not certainly not as thoroughly as a, uh, as a male burrow or, or jack would. But the burrows are so um, attuned to the dr these dry areas and the fossil evidence uh, here in the, in the West, and especially in the Southwest, uh, that they, um, they immediately revert to their age-old ways, which are very harmonious. And they actually enhance and embellish the ecosystem. Now, one thing that's been proven recently by Dr. Eric Lundgren and other ecologists is that the burrows actually dig down, and also the horses do this, they sniff out and dig down water sources and they bring them up to the surface. They create little pools uh, and then, uh, which greatly benefit all the other weaker, smaller animals. So where burrows are, they can greatly increase the, uh, the number of species and the, the water supply and all, they also do that by uh, making more uh, moisture retentive soils and more nutritious soils. And then all these different plants start springing up. So you create a little uh, micro climate and, and micro ecosystem, which is much richer. Now, it was um, a fashion, you know, for all we say, oh, the burrows, you know, they're just so destructive and look at their marks and they said the same thing about the horses yeah, and so they they zero, would zero them out in areas where for example there are the endangered fish such as ash meadows in southern nevada yeah they just said well let's let's just get rid of these burrows they're just belong here and yeah yeah and you know when they got rid of the burrows there it caused the extinction of like three endangered fish um, desert fish populations because they no longer had the burrows there. So that's the, the irony of it. And I have pointed that out throughout my career. I just knew it inherently and from my studies too. I've, I've had so many wonderful courses and, and opportunities to observe it. So uh, and the horses in, in similar ways, you know, they, they can be the saviors of these endangered species. And so people have to broaden their minds and not just judge by bias or prejudicial views, say, okay, I'm about game animals, end of story. You know, I want more deer, therefore target the puma, target the wolf, let's get rid of them. Hey, we're gonna take over their role. It's all about us, you know? And number one is that 
hunters don't act in the same way as natural predators. They take the infirm, the, the ones that are um, going out anyway, they're getting too old uh, and they can't live anymore, or they take certain we, uh, the weaker ones. So they actually own the population or make them more fit. Whereas the hunter goes in and, and blasts the most fit, one the big the deer with the huge antlers, the, the prime specimen. So he's actually weakening the, the population and it's becoming a, a domesticated or a semi-domesticated animal and natural selection is no longer operating. So there's a lot of hypocrisy involved here. And recently, uh, a few years ago, they came out with a smear film called Horse Rich and Dirt, but Dirt Poor. Uh, and that was done in collaboration with the Nevada um, Department of Wildlife and uh, the so-called Wildlife Society, which is very mainstream and establishment. And um, also, they got a, uh, a recent grad from Berkeley, my university, which usually is a progressive, uh, advanced, you know, uh, with it uh, university that, that doesn't mind going against the mainstream. Well, they got this young biologist to just sort of mouth all the old prejudice views, and they went out and they, well, here we are, the big authorities, and we're we're filming the wild horses and, oh yes, we think they're beautiful and everything, but then they go up and they go a little, um, a little uh, pool where they drink and they say, well, look at all the terrible damage they're doing. And, you know, I just have to be an objective scientist and tell you that they really don't belong here and they're just causing terrible damage. It was a big setup. I mean, it was so, so twisted and they just took little, little snapshots and then they wanted everyone just to go in an instant and say, oh, it's, it's the wild horse's fault. And, you know, and it was out, it was actually outrageous, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I knew that there was a long history of overgrazing by sheep in this area, because out in the eastern Nevada in the Antelope Valley, where those springs were, I knew the real score. I mean, I knew the history. I had studied as a graduate student. I had seen how it used to be full of grass and had an, uh, pronghorn antelope and deer and even buffalo and 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 the pumas and and the and wolves and all all the you know the golden eagles they were all there it was a beautiful balanced ecosystem but the the, the sheep particularly had just pounded that area for decades and decades from going back to the 1800s and then annihilated the, uh, the, the soils and, and so many of the water sources. And if you went a little ways away from that spring where there were bands of wild horses, you saw that there were, they were um, helping the, the ecosystem thrive. So it was a setup, you know. Yeah, well, I we only have yeah. I can't believe how, how fast this is going five minutes left. And I know that as much as you love the wild horses and burrows of the American yeah. West, you were absolutely taken with the Andean tapers. So I just wanted to save a few minutes yeah. for you to tell us about them, why they're important, yeah. and what their troubles are. Okay, yeah, I'll be glad to I just wanted to say there's actually about 100 to one. Uh, livestock and big game animals relative to our remaining wild horse and burrows. That's an important point the public on the public lands. Okay, getting to the mountain taper. Yeah, it's actually called the living fossil. And it's an amazing animal. It has a trunk like that of an elephant. And it's the only taper that has thick woolly fur. It occurs from 6,000 to 16,000 feet in the Northern Andes above the Juan Cabamba depression in Northern Peru. And I have a project going on there now. And for the past 20 years, we've been able to stave off uh, huge mining uh, companies from going in and ruining the last of those beautiful cloud forests. But I wrote the action plan for the, wild, uh, for the endangered mountain paper uh, for the paper specialist group with the World Conservation Union and I, meticulously and steadfastly um, 
uh, go ahead with that plan throughout Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and uh, Western Venezuela to try and preserve what's left and restore the species. And we have, we have declared many, many um, millions of acres actually as protected habitat and the people are becoming much more aware. It has the same beneficial effects as the wild horses. Seeds the plant, enriches the soil. It's an integral part of the ecosystem. It's also a prey animal, certain of the predatory animals, but that, that's nature's balance. But there's only about 2,000, 2,500, 3,000 left. So this is a really seriously endangered species. And it's, uh, but through public education and veganism, getting people away from all this hang up on animal products. And that, I always stress that. I said, hey, quinoa is your complete food. It's right from, from the Andes. Eat quinoa, eat beans, eat squash, eat, eat uh, tropiellum or nasturtium fruit. Uh, all, all those wonderful fruit that you have there, they're so healthy. I really miss those tropical fruits like guanabana, for example, it's just like the nectar of the gods. So, so I'm on that. I'm on that and we're winning. We're winning. And in so many areas, the people are waking up and I have given many talks written uh, articles and ended conferences and, and uh, written paper uh, scientific papers for the mountain tapers. Oh, that's wonderful. I'll bet everybody is going to go Google taper. It's T-A-P-I-R. Yeah. And, and you can see a picture of this wonderful animal. And also, uh, Craig is president of the Andean Taper Fund and Wild Horse and Burrow Fund. So that's one organization, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, actually it's the Andean Taper Fund. It's a 501c3 and I have a branch called the Wild Horse and Burrow Fund, if people prefer. Uh, it's, uh, actually, the, it's been expanded so I can send all members of the horse, paper, and rhino families. In other words, all, all members of the parasodactyl order of Odd toed uh, hoofed uh, herbivores. Part of the life community. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So, well, this yeah. has been so inspiring to me and, and so informative. And I think yeah. that I focus a lot on farmed animals, as I think many of our listeners do, you know, being vegan. But the idea that this life community is so vast and so wonderful and really needs our help is right. so important. And you've shown that to us today. So everybody do check out this remarkable man and his work, the wild horse org, And it does have the T-H-E there at the beginning. We will put all the rest of his URLs and information at mainstreetvegan.net. Thanks to everybody for listening. Thanks to Unity Online Radio for being behind the scenes, making it all happen. And to everybody, God bless you. Eat your veggies.